Lord, speak to us by your Son, whom you have appointed heir of all things. Amen. When I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have set in their courses, what are mortals that you should be mindful of them? mere human beings, that you should seek them out. Even through the centuries that separate us and the dry parchment that carried his thoughts, you can still hear the wonder in the voice of the psalmist as he utters those words. For us today, the wonder is somewhat diluted, diminished, but you, if you can find a place remote from the pollution of light which surrounds modern civilization, you can again truly appreciate the glories of the heavens, the work of God's fingers. And perhaps through that appreciation, we can all understand, gain a better understanding, a truer perspective on our own place in the created order of things. And I think if we're honest, that's probably something which would do none of us any harm. One of the joys of our still cautious emergence from lockdown is the number of baptisms postponed because of the earlier restrictions that we're now able to conduct. And close behind is the number of weddings. All wonderful and all very different. There are few institutions more subject to current and local mores than a wedding. But marriage, the union of two souls and bodies, has the same significance now as it had in Jesus' time. Now when the Pharisees ask Jesus the question in today's Gospel, they don't have an actual pastoral situation in mind, though they may have been prompted by the fact that King Herod had recently divorced his wife in order to marry Herodias, herself recently divorced by Herod's brother. But the intent of the Pharisees was clearly nothing more than to trick Jesus. They are well aware of the scripture, the two shall become one flesh. They are well aware that Moses reluctantly framed the law to allow a man to divorce his wife by handing her a certificate of dismissal. What they are also aware of, though we are perhaps not, is that the basis of marriage in those days and that society was very different from today. Much less an emotional relationship and more a business arrangement. He provided her with a home and food. She cleaned and cooked these respectively. And of course, she bore him his children. Divorce was all too frequently the result of the toll that these things had taken on him and his desire to trade in for a younger model. And the fate of the divorced woman was grim. She had no hope of another husband, still less employment. Her only means of supporting herself were begging or worse, prostitution. Hence, Jesus' answer to the Pharisees. The sort of divorce they refer to is little more than legalised adultery. In that context, then, what man has joined together, let no man put asunder. Sorry, what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. And yes, I have used the older gender-specific language, and actually in this case, I think it's probably not entirely inappropriate. Jesus elsewhere summarises the law as love God and love your neighbour. But we see here that it's possible to act within the letter of the law and show little love for your neighbour or your wife. And Jesus, whose whole being and message was based on love, could never tolerate that. But please be very clear 
His answer was a specific response to the question and context posed to him by the Pharisees. It was not a general condemnation of divorcees. I once saw a photo, a rather grainy image, a fuzzy but unmistakable white outline on a black background, an ultrasound of an unborn child, a child which had been conceived through IVF for a couple who thought they had otherwise never had children. The caption simply read one of God's miracles. And I believe that that child was as much a miracle of God's grace as of scientific ingenuity, as is every child, however created and conceived. In today's passage from Genesis, we read that God formed the animals of the field and the birds of the air from the ground. I read recently of a child who asked, why did God make giraffes? Look at a giraffe sometime. The longer you look, the better the question gets. We don't fully understand the process that resulted in a giraffe, or an elephant, or a lowland street tenry, or Glaucus Atlanticus, a type of sea slug. And by the way, Google them and you'll find the photos. But God was behind that process. God made the rules and set the process in motion. And watch a simulation of the two halves of the DNA molecule, the double helix, unravelling, unwinding and reforming into two exact copies of the original. It would have been perfectly possible for each creature to give birth to its offspring in isolation by parthenogenesis, creating a new generation identical to the previous one. But no, it is not good that the man should be alone. So God creates woman and each generation is the synthesis of the DNA of two parents. Humans are the only animal, the only species, which copulates face to face, for whom the identity of the partner providing the other half of the genes for your children is so vitally important. And look at the wondrous diversity that that generates. In that ultrasound photo, in the maternity ward of our hospital, Whenever you go into our schools, little miracles, every one. No wonder the psalmist writes, out of the mouths of infants and children, your majesty is praised in the heavens. No wonder, he continues, when I consider your heavens, even the works of your fingers, what are human beings that you should be mindful of them? And yet, you have made them little lower than the angels. You adorn them with glory and honour. No wonder, Jesus says, let the little children come to me. For it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. And then he took them in his arms and laid his hands on them and blessed them. O oh Lord our God, how exalted is your name in all the world. Amen.